who are the factions and how will it all come together. And we've got, uh, we have four experts to guide us through this, uh, one of whom is uh, delayed by a, a train. We hope he will be appearing soon. That's Rob Campia, but I'm going to introduce the other three uh, folks we have here to help us walk through these issues. So on your right is Allison Holcomb. Allison is the director of the ACLU's Campaign for Smart Justice, which is direct at reducing mass incarceration in the United States. Before she was in the national office, she worked at the ACLU in Washington State, where she and her colleagues drafted that state's marijuana legalization law and also led the campaign. She is also, I am proud to say, a graduate of Stanford University. Uh, next to her is Graham Boyd. Graham is the founder and director of New Approach PAC, uh, which um, I'm sorry, and Graham is an attorney who advises a group of philanthropists who fund the majority of marijuana reform efforts in the United States. He has played a guiding role in opinion research, legal drafting, and campaign design for marijuana reform measures throughout the United States and abroad. And then immediately to my left is Jeff Sinsmeister. Jeff is his executive vice president of SAM, which stands for Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Prior to working for that organization, he had extensive experience in Latin American public policy, including working as a US diplomat in Mexico City, where he oversaw a $55 million portfolio of drug demand reduction and anti-corruption activities. So very glad to have you all here. And if I forgot to introduce myself, I'm Keith Humphreys. I'm a professor at Stanford University. So we're, I thought I would start with you, Graham. We're in a bubble here. We're in a, a cannabis policy forum, which I think defines us as rather unusually interested in this issue. The average voter doesn't go to forums like this, and they don't think about it. But you, you've spent a lot of time studying the average voter. What is it that makes a person who normally doesn't think about cannabis walk into a voting booth in this country in November and say, yeah, I really want this legal or or I don't um, <clears throat> well I think that's shifting first of all um, it, it, certainly as, as I think everybody knows the trend in voter opinion nationally and in the states where it's being considered has been towards support for legalization generally and also and importantly towards the belief that legalization is inevitable um, so that's something that a very considerable 70, 80 percent of voters believe that legalization of marijuana is inevitable, which then sort of gives one permission to vote that way. But we've done a lot of research about voter attitudes and, and, and a few things that are, I think, not intuitively obvious. Um, voters in most states, uh, and, and I'll sort of exclude maybe the South from this, but through much of the country, voters are divided roughly into thirds. A third who um, like marijuana, who have familiarity with it, who probably use it or have used it, um, and who think of it as basically a good thing, and therefore legalization and feel solid about that. There are about a third of the voters who, who really don't like marijuana, um, who, who generally don't have much personal experience with it, um, but sometimes have, in fact, quite often have sort of second-hand experience. Someone in their life, and you know, an uncle, a cousin, a family member, or somebody down the street, um, is not that successful in life and appears to be using marijuana, and which I, I don't think is an argument that the marijuana causes that lack of success, but, but, the, but, but the, the two are associated in the mind of that person. And just general, the stigma, the morality, the it's bad, they don't like marijuana, they're not gonna vote for it, and that's about a third. So obviously the whole ball game is that middle third. And here's the thing that's interesting. Most of the middle third are not that interested in this issue. So they don't walk into the voter uh, voting booth sort of excited about, oh boy, I'm gonna get to vote on yes or no on, on, on this issue. They really don't care that much about it. Um, many of them don't have that much familiarity with marijuana. Um, and many of them would probably just as soon that if you had a magic wand and could make marijuana go away, they might actually prefer that. But, but that middle third is pragmatic um, uh, for the most part, I mean, I'm grossly generalizing here, but is pragmatic, understands that what we have done historically uh, in prohibiting, treating it as a crime is a terrible failure as a policy, and so are open to a, a new approach. And that actually was the name of the campaign that Allison uh, ran in Washington. It's the name of the um, organization that I'm running now nationally. And it sort of starts from the modest idea of we don't have all the answers here, but we do know that what we've done before is not working. We do know that removing the criminal prohibitions and using regulation is better. And if that middle third of voters is convinced that what you're doing is actually a sincere 
effort that is going to both um, sort of remove the criminal prohibitions and all the downsides of that and at the same time put in place a regulatory structure that's going to be protective, then they're going to vote for it. And that's precisely why in four states marijuana legalization has passed and why I think it will pass in some additional states in 2016 and ultimately across the country. So the, the point that, that Mark Kleiman made in the opening about marijuana legalization is complicated and has to be thought through. It sounds like from what you're saying that really is only it's only a third of the country really believes that. Like about a third of people are really just for this and a third of people are against it and it's that group that you know, depends on the particulars is, is going to decide this ball game. Is it? it is, but you know, I think it's almost a, a, a sense of trust and a feeling in that middle third. It's okay. not, I mean, the, the most voters are not digging into, into, the, the, details, details, into right, the details sure. of legalization. Most voters would be bored out of their mind if they were at this conference. It, it's just not that interesting to them. Um, <laughs> And I think some well, one we of, are, but yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but one of the mistakes that I think was made in some of the earlier unsuccessful legalization campaigns was the idea that well, I, I mean, as I think many people in this room understand, marijuana is less harmful than alcohol. It is not, you know, the gateway d drug and the demon weed that you know it's been painted to be. None of that's true, but. Um, a campaign that's founded on we need to make people understand that and talk about marijuana and change attitudes about marijuana itself has not been really successful. Equally, trying to engage people about the details, the complicated details of marijuana regulation, not that interesting. I think what people want to hear is that there's a plan, there are responsible adults who are going to figure this stuff out, and, um, and, and it's better than what we've done before. I mean, it's, it's kind of, in a weird way, kind of that simple. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Je Jeff, I want to get your perspective. Your organization will, I assume, be working against uh, uh, legalization initiatives in a number of states. Do you see the politics? You know, I, I know you have a different political view on the outcome, but when, when you look at the voter, do you see the same kinds of phenomena that Graham is describing? I think that's already on. Great. Uh, yes, to some degree. I mean, I, I think we can agree that, frankly, the vast majority of people are absolutely positively uninterested in the details. Uh, I think we can also agree that it's really that swing vote, at, whether it's a third or not, I'm not, a, you know, you're, frankly, your numbers are probably better than, than, than mine in that sense, but I think that's also probably correct. Um, and I would go a step further and to say that I think voters generally are, it, it, it goes even beyond sort of a feeling of, well, they're responsible adults, et cetera. I think it goes down to a sort of a, even something more visceral. And I don't think this is exclusive to marijuana policy. I mean, I, having worked on political issues across a couple of continents, I, I say it's really, frankly, true on almost anything that goes up to a, a popular vote or a plebiscite. Um, it's that sort of gut feeling of, well, we need to change this or, oh, we don't. Um, so, I, I, yes, to that extent, yes, I, I agree. Uh, another tendency, or I think a dynamic that people often forget is that most successful legalization ballot initiatives to date have effectively been unopposed. And when I say unopposed, I don't mean that there was an absence of a no campaign. What I mean is there was an absence of a no campaign that was funded enough not to go dollar for dollar with the yes campaign. And frankly, as this becomes more of a corporately funded uh, uh, movement, it becomes very difficult to do that. But to be funded to the level where a you know, a, a statewide sophisticated media campaign that sort of does message testing, et cetera, um, can, can, be, can be mounted. And where you do see that, and I specifically am thinking of, of California in 2010, which I think was Proposition I don't know, 19. God, there's just so many propositions in California, you sort of lose track. Um, and then in Ohio last year, where you did have sort of those minimum thresholds met, you see a very different dynamic. Um, I mean, Ohio, I think, is a great example uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because of the swing in the polls that took place. When you looked at the initial polling that was done on the issue, it was polling, the yeses were polling around the mid-50s, which for a ballot initiative is not actually not great. It, usually if you're below 60%, it can be a bit of a red flag. But that was before any money had really been sunk into the campaign. Um, the swing on that was about, I think, 15 to 18 points, something like that. I mean, it ended up being defeated 64 to 36, more or less, somewhere in that range. Um, and, and now, and, and so you, you can see, I think, that is the influence, largely, of an actual organized no campaign that has not existed in most other places. I don't know if you look at, like, Oregon, or something, for example. Uh, the second thing is, is that often people will look at Ohio and they say, yeah, well, Ohio, that was different. It was a, a marijuana monopoly, and it was a different initiative 
negative than what we saw uh, in other states and people didn't like the corporate aspect of it. And, and my answer to that criticism is yes, but. And the but is, that is a hindsight view of what actually happened and I would posit, people here may disagree, but I would, I would posit that the reason that people know of the Ohio initiative as the marijuana monopoly initiative is because of the no campaign and because of the PR and the sophistication of the media campaign that, that focused on the no vote. So in other words, you don't call it the marijuana monopoly uh, initiative because of what was in the initiative. You refer to it as that and you know it as that because there was actually sophisticated campaign that was branding it as that. So as we look at this cycle, the states in which you do have a sophisticated no campaign, I think you have to sort of look at it through a slightly different lens and see that this may be a, a, a different dynamic. And the second thing I'd add on to that is this crop of initiatives, and I might exclude California's initiative because frankly, beyond being almost impenetrable, I have read every word of it, but I don't recommend it unless you want to go to sleep. Um, this crop of initiatives is extremely industry favorable and it probably reflects the industry's financial stake in it. But I mean, you see, you see elements of these initiatives, for example, that are so industry friendly to be almost surprising even to somebody who considers himself fairly jaded on this, uh, on this topic. Actually, I'm going to stop Sorry. for a minute because I do want to go into the individual initiatives a minute, but I want to bring Allison into this because she's been through uh, the trenches literally in Washington state. So people who don't live in Washington Think of it as like there's Seattle and that's basically it. But my brother lives out in eastern Washington. I'm sure you actually had to persuade a lot of people from that region uh, as well as other regions of the state. What opposition did you face? What arguments did you use? And what in your judgment moved people to vote for I-502? So, um, yes, so Initiative 502 actually passed in 20 out of 39 counties in Washington and got outside of the Puget Sound bubble in a very successful way. The rule of thumb in, in Washington is that um, if you go up to the top of the Space Needle and do a 360 turn, you've just seen all the votes that you need to win anything in the state. And we could have had a very uh, Puget Sound specific strategy, but instead we did in fact uh, go east of the mountains and talk to voters there and one Spokane County and other counties east of the mountains as well. Um, I think that our strategy was twofold in terms of messaging. Graham is absolutely right that the pragmatic messages are the ones that carry the overwhelming majority of voters. And voters now, I think even when we tested them in polling, and, and obviously I think it's a good point is being made that we haven't seen a very significant paid opposition campaign, but we do test opposition messages in our public opinion research, and we really put proposals through the ringer, um, thinking of the most powerful opposition arguments that we can to the idea of legalizing cannabis. And um, the proposals still hold up, and I think that that is because uh, a majority of American voters, the 60 to 70 percent that think that cannabis legalization is inevitable, understand on a fundamental level that using the criminal sanction to try to nudge human behavior when it comes to cannabis does not pencil out under any cost-benefit analyses. They know enough and, and now about money going to law enforcement to treat people like criminals for cannabis, and that's just not how they want their tax dollars used. And of course, there is the corresponding argument that we'd also like to generate some tax revenue if we could, much as uh, that was a, one of the winning arguments in the repeal of alcohol prohibition. But the, the details of how the regulatory structure would work, how the rules would be established, all of the um, safety bumpers that were built into the initiative, while not important to the overwhelming number of voters, they didn't want to get into that uh, granular level of detail, it was important to the people that we needed as validators for the campaign. So this was a campaign where we were not going to file an initiative until we had faces other than the ACLUs at the front of the campaign. And so we were very fortunate to draft an initiative that met the muster of one of our audience members, Seattle City Attorney Pete Holmes, who agreed to be one of the sponsors of the initiative, um, and also uh, was found persuasive by former U.S. Attorney General, excuse me, U.S. Attorney John McKay. 
um, federal prosecutor who came into the debate uh, as part of our public education campaign when we invited him to a town hall event um, and asked him the question of how he thought uh, marijuana prohibition was working out at the federal level. And once uh, he was a voice recognized in Washington media as saying, we need to revisit these laws from top to bottom because it isn't working to try to uh, treat cannabis use as a crime, um, that really started to uh, elevate the issue so that at least more of the opinion leaders, the people whose voices would make a difference to voters and give them that level of comfort to say, yes, there are responsible people that are going to work out the details about how this um, uh, law will actually be implemented was critical, was a critical component to the campaign. Thank you, Allison. So why don't we get it now into specific ballot initiatives. When, when the three of you look around the country, and I'll, I'll go to each one of you on this, I'll start with you, Jeff, and just work our way down. Where do you think uh, an initiatives, uh, what states are most likely to win, and where do you think they're most likely to lose? Boy, I mean, that's, uh, that top line question, I think, is very difficult to say. I think it I would have to fall back, and I really do think it depends largely on how well organized and funded the no campaign is. Uh, if, if, if there is no no campaign, it is, I mean, it's like having a boxing match with only one fighter in the ring. I mean, you, the outcome is generally, uh, you know, fairly preordained. Um, it's really going to depend a lot on that. Well, what states do you see as uh, likely to mount a significant no campaign, if any? I mean, you already see one in Massachusetts that launched a couple of days ago, I think on Thursday, that has the backing of both the Republican governor and the, the very liberal Democratic uh, attorney general and the mayor of Boston. I think that's a, going to be a very serious contender. Uh, there's an or there should be an organized campaign in California as well. That's it's already they they've been through this before in 2010. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see the same thing take place in 2016. Nevada and and, and Arizona, there are there is activity. Now the big question, big question is is will they will they raise enough money to be a mm -hmm. you know to sort of be a force or not? And who who gives money? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, we, you know, we're primarily, we have a C4 arm, but we're primarily a C3. And so these are not, I mean, if Rob were here, I would say, you know, I'd say that this, we're not like a marijuana policy project in the sense they're not our campaigns. Um, but oftentimes in Ohio, I can say is big donors were businesses who felt like they were going to have serious balance sheet losses because of impairment on the job. And they saw it as a real threat to their bottom line. The Chamber of Commerce was very active there. Mm. Um, and, and I think there's, I mean, there's hard data supporting that. I mean, you see big increases in on-the-job accidents, uh, both in terms of third-party liability, workers' comp claims, that kind of thing, when you have impaired workers. So I think that's a big a potential donor. Potential donor yeah. So, uh, Graham, how do you read the map? Where are we most likely uh, to have legalization, and where, is, where are initiatives most likely to uh, be rejected? Sure. Well, first of all, there are medical marijuana initiatives also right. going if we, forward. Okay, let's just focus on recreational okay, for a minute and we'll get back to medical. Okay. Sorry. So recreational, the states that, um, uh, well, Maine is a, is a bit of a question mark right now because there was a action by the state, uh, Secretary of State to basically throw out the signatures of many of the people who had uh, signed petitions to put it on the ballot. Um, the lawsuit uh, reversed that decision but it still is a little bit in play, and so there's a say, I'd say there's a small possibility it ends up not being on the ballot in Maine. But if it is on the ballot, I think it's very likely to pass. Um, likewise, Massachusetts. I think that, that the um, opposition from the elected officials that, that you just mentioned um, makes it harder. Um, but in terms of the level of support in both of those states, it's quite robust. And, and the other thing, too, and just in terms of how opposition campaigns would play out in, 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 in both of those states and California, um, it, 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 from, the, from the research that we've done, I would say five years ago, voters were much more volatile. Um, they were much more likely to sort of say, oh, I hear this argument, yes, that sounds good. Oh, I hear this ar argument, no, that sounds really bad. Um, Voter views have stabilized considerably, and, and so there's only a tiny, so my sort of third in the middle, yeah. most of that third has actually started to congeal around a particular position. And I think actually even with a, with a very robust no campaign, um, you wouldn't see a huge amount of movement. I think that probably you would still end up being victorious. I mean, I, you know, my, my view of the, 
Ohio initiative is, is very different than yours. I don't think it was because of the no campaign. I think it was because it was a terrible initiative. Um, and, and people knew that. I mean, most of, the, most of the people who I consider my friends and allies thought it was a terrible initiative. Um, I'm not sure I would have voted for it if I lived in Ohio. Um, I think that thing really fell of its own um, weight. To continue across the map, um, California looks to be in very good shape. The polling there is is, is very very positive. Like what? Um, like what's the? 55, I mean, it's 60? you know the in the sixty percent range, 60%. Um, and 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 it's and I'm referring to public polls here. I'm going to be careful not to talk here about any of the private polling we've done. But, um, but beyond that, it's also a very well-organized campaign. It's a well-funded campaign, and it, and, it, and it is grounded on the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission that, that you participated in, Keith. I mean, I think that, that it really does rest on the foundation of some very, very good gathering of diverse views and opinions, and, it, it, and it's not, you know, it doesn't 100% reflect the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission, but it's very close to that, and, and having the backing of Gavin Newsom um, is, is important. Um, Nevada and Arizona, I think I know less about those, and, and if, if Rob's train gets him here on time, he can talk about those. My impression is that you know the, the demographics of those states are very different than, than any of the ones I've mentioned so far. I think that they are in some ways um, but more like Alaska, which is uh, which did vote to legalize, but uh, you know, it, it, it victory there is going to depend on having a, a pretty solid support among libertarians, um, and uh, w without having as much of a sort of you know Democrat and you know, liberal or progressive base to rely on. But you know, my prediction is I think legalization is going to pass in all of the states I just all named. The one other state that is potentially in play is Michigan. There, are, there are two efforts there to. Um, gather signatures and get it on to the ballot for 2016. My guess is they're going to come up short, but um, but they're still they're still talking the talk of uh, and 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 even making steps towards qualifying. And if it does qualify in Michigan, I think it would have some some good prospect of winning. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Allison. How do you see the map? So it's been a while since I've been focused specifically on, on cannabis legalization and with the, the shift in focus to um, over-incarceration more generally, um, I've also seen a geographic um, shift in my focus and I'm looking more at the South. Um, the question uh, about what states are likely to go depends in large part on who has statewide ballot initiatives as an, as an option in their state and you don't see very many states in the South that have that as an option. What I will say from the public opinion research research that we've done about voter attitudes about the criminal justice system in general is that I would think that the South, um, with uh, some focused attention, would be a place ripe for legislative moves toward decriminalization. Um, we've seen support in the high 80s and 90s for ideas that um, drug addicts generally should not be incarcerated, uh, that there should be more resources available for treatment, both mental health treatment and substance abuse treatment. And I think the, the DC race, Initiative 71 in 2014, is um, an interesting lesson, albeit we're talking about a, a smaller population, but then we have a lot of smaller populations in the South, but a very explicit racial justice-based campaign that had strong grassroots organizing attacks to it was very effective. That was the strongest passing measure um, with a 70% majority that we've seen so far since we started to see uh, legalization measures um, passing in 2012. Finally, um, I'll just throw in my comment about Ohio. I don't think it was either the opposition campaign or the uh, nature of the initiative itself, except for the fact that it allowed the attorney general to put the word monopoly on the, on the ballot mm -hmm. and the ballot title, the description of it. And uh, because voters aren't paying that much attention to the meat of these measures, um, what you see in the voter materials is really heavily influential on your vote. And so you had issue two and issue three three right next to each other, one calling the marijuana legalization a monopoly and the other saying we shouldn't put monopolies in the Constitution. And I think that pretty much makes your case for you for just about anybody, um, regardless of what, how you feel about marijuana, um, plus the fact that, of course, you've got a 2015 voter turnout, which is very different from either a presidential election or an off-year right. even number. Right, yeah. So all those kids who landed on boardwalk with a big hotel have a negative reaction to that word. Probably it doesn't pull well, monopoly. Um, yeah, to, to 2015, I, I want to bring out this other point. So, uh, and by the way, you can 
you can uh, send questions to uh, that number there, and uh, uh, Jesse is, is processing them. One that came through is relevant to this point about this, these three groups of people is who turns out in different elections. I think it's hard to overlook the fact that 2010, California's legalization uh, lost, 2015, Ohio's lost, but your, your initiative passed in 2012, and we're coming up on 2016. I think anybody who follows politics knows the makeup of the electorate is wildly different in America in what we would, you know, some of you might call a by-election, but our off-year off elections. Far more turnout of people of color, far, far more turnout of young people. Does that shift this equation of the, the, the three-thirds? Are the people who are sort of for it no matter what going to come out more in 2016? Do you see that? Let me ask you, Jeff, because it could probably be challenging. No, I, you know, I, I, I would comment mainly on the, the, the Ohio principle. And I wish I had the numbers in front of me because, I, I, you know, it would help me be a little bit more concrete. But turnout in that cycle there in that particular election was unusually high. Let me just interrupt you for yeah. a second. I just want to welcome Rob Campia to the stage. Uh, glad to have you here, Rob. Uh, Amtrak. <laughs> here for Amtrak. Um, uh, Rob is the founding executive director of Marijuana Policy Project, and he's worked on legalization initiatives in a number of states, including, if I remember right, Alaska and Oregon. Am I right? Alaska and Colorado. Alaska and Colorado. I'm sorry. Alaska and Colorado. Um, I'm glad to have you here, Rob. So, we, um, I'm sorry, Jeff. Let's go back to you about the 2016 electoral makeup and, and how you see this playing out. Sure. Uh, it, it's a little hard to say. I mean, again, I, uh, the, Turnout in Ohio was was much higher than was predicted. At least I'm probably we think driven in some part because of of the marijuana initiative. But again, that's you know sort of reading these tea leaves in hindsight. I, I think it's also important to point out that the crop of initiatives this year look very different from the ones that were passed in 2012, at least in their details. Now again, a lot of it depends on whether you have an organized no campaign that is funded at minimum levels to, to get that word out. But I mean, you have very unusual initiatives this cycle as compared to the ones four years ago. Now, whether that makes a difference or not, I don't, I mean, I really, I, I will be honest, I really don't know. Uh, I think it's, we're, we're gonna find out more and more as, as, as these campaigns begin to, to mm -hmm. get their messages out and there's more polling done on them. And, and how, how, about, how about the rest of you? Do you look at the, as 2016 as you know, the makeup of the electorate uniquely favorable um, compared to what you faced before? And anyway, well, Rob, you'd sorry, if, you, if you're comfortable coming straight off the train into a discussion, please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Sorry I'm late again. I'm track. Government subsidized program. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't really think that 2016 is unique in terms of voter turnout. I would say that it will probably just be analogous to other presidential um, turnout models. And so in that way, no matter, even if a, a particular state has a low turnout for the average presidential election, it would still be much higher than what happened in Ohio last year, uh, an odd numbered uh, an odd year election is going to have a low turnout no matter what your get out the vote operation is. So 2016 will be wonderful for a lot of our marijuana initiatives because we're going to automatically get a high turnout across the board. Great. Allison, you want to comment on this? Yeah, I just wanted to comment. Um, again, this goes back to the opposition um, campaign argument a bit. You know, Alaska's measure too, and, and Rob is in a better position to talk about this, but it, I think, had a fairly sizable opposition campaign compared to some of the other. Um, marijuana legalization campaigns, and, and um, it, it felt like, anyway, from the outside, that it got a fair amount of attention in the press, and it's also a state that um, I know that the, the high rates of alcohol um, abuse among the Native American populations was a concern that was played up in national media, and it was an, an off year, not an odd off year, but it still came in with 53% of the vote, and so it feels to me like Alaska is one of those cases that sort of, uh, I think, makes Graham's case again, that this is really an inevitability issue. And as long as your measure um, isn't quite as problematic and doesn't open the kinds of doors that Ohio did for its own attacks on itself, um, I think any year is ripe now for moving legalization forward. So something that happened in California in 2010 was that the ballot initiative to legalize was polling reasonably well, and the state legislature decriminalized marijuana. And when Governor Schwarzenegger signed it, he said he was doing this in part to take the air out of the initiative. 
Now, do you see any legislators having that same reaction now, saying, wow, you know, I may not want to do this, but uh, this is going to happen in my state. I, I want to get in the game and do something I can control more or is more to my policy uh, preferences. Anyone see anything like that going on? Well, well I think... I mean, what you described in California in 2010, those are, it's accurate that that law passed and that that was the motivation for, for the governor. It didn't have an impact on the voters. Um, we did a lot of research uh, before, during, and after the election. Uh, the, the voters didn't know that that had happened, and that certainly didn't influence their um, decision about it. Um, and we could talk some about what did. But it wasn't that. And, and, and so I would kind of turn your question a, a little bit sideways, which is just to say that I think that politicians are becoming increasingly comfortable with the idea of reforming marijuana laws. And um, I'm going to leave Rob to talk about Vermont and sort of, you know, and, and other, actually other states too. Uh, Hawaii is the one I will talk about because I've been doing some work there. And, um, and then more generally sort of federal electeds um, it's being destigmatized. It, it was, um, I, you know, I'm thinking back to 2010 um, when talking to folks in D.C. about, you know, how do you get a conversation going about marijuana policy? And what I was told by some, you know, very respectable inside kind of politics people in D.C. was anybody who brings up the topic of marijuana in a serious conversation is looked at as just being a buffoon. Mm -hmm. it, is not a, it is not a serious issue. It is only, it's a marginal issue that marginal people argue about on both sides. Um, that's not true anymore. I think that, that, that whether you are pro or anti a particular reform, I think you're now part of a very serious conversation that serious people are having. And that then creates a space for legislators to do things not like the California stunt of trying to take wind out of an election, but actually doing their job and trying to come up with good policies and enacting them. And, that, and that's happening, and I know our topic today is ballot initiatives, but certainly in the legislative side, I think you're going to see different forms of marijuana legalization take place over the next five years. Yeah. I think it's worth maybe just looking a little at legislation, at least particularly Vermont, because quite a bit has happened there. Um, l l let, me, let me get your, your perspective, uh, Rob. What, what do you see going on in Vermont, and do you think they will pull the trigger on this? So in Vermont, uh, I don't know if you've covered this yet, but the state Senate passed a legalization bill, and the House, the first House committee gutted it, the second House committee improved it, but it's still not legalization. It's more of like a D.C. Uh, home grow and possession is legal. So that's sort of where it's sitting at in the House right now. Then it has to go through another committee or two in the House, and then the House and the Senate will reconcile in a conference committee. So our desire is to see something come out of the House. Obviously, legalization is the desire, but it might be a watered-down legalization bill. But something coming out of the House is important because we'd like the House and the Senate to have the opportunity to talk about their competing models and hopefully give birth to something that is, in fact, legalization. Uh, in Vermont, we're in a better position than we are in most states, because in a lot of states, we're the outsiders who are coming in and either begging or hammering government officials to do the right thing, whereas in Vermont, most of the government officials are, in fact, on our side. So the governor, Peter Shumlin, is a Democrat. Uh, for the first time, I think, in the history of the country, um, a sitting governor included marijuana legalization in the state of the state address. So he included legalization as a priority earlier this year. This is his last year in office. So we are cautiously optimistic that we're gonna pass something that looks like a legalization law in Vermont, and if it happens, it would happen in the next two months. And if not, then we have to start over again in January, not only with a new legislative session, but with a new governor. And what are the motivations that you see among those legislators who are trying to do this? The primary motivator is uh, that they all know that prohibition doesn't work. And so now that they're seeing across the country other states acknowledging that prohibition doesn't work and making a buck off of it, um, it's, you know, the legislators in Vermont, I think, 
without any real conversation, have come to the conclusion that marijuana prohibition clearly does not prevent people from using marijuana. It certainly doesn't prevent young people from using marijuana, which was the, exactly the whole point of prohibition in the first place. And so once you acknowledge it, and now that you get a chance to see the models working in real life in Colorado and Washington State, then it's not too far of a leap to then try to do your own thing in Vermont. So Vermont is still looking pretty good, but not as good as it was a month or two ago. And then Rhode Island will be either first or second in line with regard to legalization through the state legislature. Jeff, has your organization been working in Vermont? If, if so, we're I'd in, like to get your take on so, it. I mean we're, we're in t I mean, we're in touch with the folks there, and that the, 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 the C4 has been involved a little bit. I mean, uh, you know, sort of on the... On the not a major funder, obviously, like on the other side, like uh, Rob's or organization, but uh, but yes, we're f obviously following it very closely. Um, we do you we, think it's going to they're, they're going to legalize this? Year? Uh, no, I mean we're sort of you know I'd say cautiously optimistic, but on the other side of the the issue. But of course, you know, we probably wouldn't expect anything else. But uh, yes, I mean I, we see the House process basically as not being favorable to that bill. Um, of course, what happens in the, with the next state administration is anybody's guess as well. But uh, I would say you may see some type of very watered down bill. I would even say that the DC model is unlikely, but it, I mean, it's possible, anything's possible. Um, but I'm, we remain cautiously optimistic there. Would you ever get to a point as an organization of advising a legislator about a state, you know, it's gonna pass by initiative anyway, uh, and initiatives are irrevocable, It'd be better off to legalize on your own terms, and then you can go back and tweak it like you can other legislation. No, we we don't recommend that for really the, the big reason that once you allow an industry to coalesce at the state level, whether it's done by initiative or whether it's done by uh, through the legislature, it's very difficult to to push anything back. I mean, they just have they just have way too much money and political power, uh, and so. You know, you, you already see this in states where, you know... I was, ask, I was asking you something different. So, so let's say the initiative's polling at 80%. So a state's going to legalize. Sure. So, so now, now you're talking to a legislator, and you can say, look, I hate this, but um, good government means, uh, you know, trying to keep some control of this issue. You're better off passing a law than you are throwing this out to the voters. Would you think you would ever get to that point? I mean, you know, I, we've never been in that. So frankly, we've never seen a, an initiative polling at 80 percent, et cetera. So, I mean, I, not to sort of, you know, say, oh, I'm not going to answer the hypothetical, but we, we would obviously not want to be put in that situation. It's not something that we would like to do. Uh, if we were put in that situation, I, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be inclined to say no. I mean, we just think very principled, you know, sort of on, on principle, it's on not something terms. we would want yeah. to do that. Yeah. yeah. So who's going to fund these initiatives? Initiatives are expensive, especially in California. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just start with you, we'll go down. Who, who's going to put in, who's going to put in the, uh, the cash it takes to do television advertising, to, to uh, tell the voter about the initiative and all that sort of thing? Uh, Keith, are you referring to the no's or the yes? Uh, I, was, I was actually, who's going to pay for the initiative? So yes, these are all legalization initiatives. Who's going to sure. support legalization financially this cycle? Sure. I mean, I'm not going to put, put words in the mouths of the folks who actually know the numbers, but our, you know, what we see is, is we see it, money coming in, obviously, from the, 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 the marijuana industry, the existing marijuana industry. I mean, I, I know Rob's organization has a, a capital campaign out right now uh, looking to obtain a a percentage of the, the net margins of, of cannabis businesses uh, across the country. Uh, we see it coming in from, we, we think, at least if I suspect, the alcohol industry in Nevada has something to do with it since there is a, uh, they get sort of a first to market advantage in part of the, the, the marijuana, the recreational marijuana market there through that initiative. And uh, possibly, I would imagine the medical, you know, some of the medical businesses in some of the states as well. That I would imagine that's a state by state thing because in some states you see a very, like in Massachusetts, the medical marijuana industry has largely come out in opposition, or at least the sort of prominent lobbyists have come out in opposition to the recreational initiative there. Whereas in other states, that that hasn't been the case. Uh, so that would be my my hunch. Of course, I don't have access to you know their internal documents or anything. So I'm hypothesizing. Let me, I, I, I'll let each of you opine this, but I, I want to ask Graham, because I know you advise individuals who contribute to this campaign, and I, I, I imagine some of them are uh, in the business. Are, are some of them also not motivated out of a political uh, commitment? So th th this idea of big, nefarious marijuana industry uh, being behind these initiatives is just uh, wrong. 
Um, the large majority of the funding uh, for the initiative so far, and this will remain true in 2016, the large majority, overwhelming majority, comes from philanthropists who believe that our old policies are no good and that these new policies are better. Um, Even if they themselves don't intend to invest, they have this as a, a libertarian social justice uh, yeah, motivation. Absolutely, yeah. and they don't. I mean, the, the, the folks that I work with are not involved in the industry. Um, I, I worked um, until he passed away about two years ago. I worked for Peter Lewis who was the founder of Progressive Insurance, um, a major donor to universities, to arts, and to a number of um, progressive political organizations, and was never involved in the marijuana industry and was never interested in being involved in the marijuana industry. Um, members of his family and other philanthropists who continue um, to support that work come at it similarly. They're, they're Genuine people, good-hearted people who want to, who who have a vision of how the world could be a better place, and use their philanthropy to advance that. Um, speaking even to the industry part of it, it is true that there is more industry involvement now than there was two or four years ago. I don't think that this is a bad thing, um, because in fact, the people who are perhaps most against taxing, regulating, and legalizing marijuana are the people who are benefiting from a system of unregulated illegal marijuana, that is the illegal marijuana growers and sellers right now. Um, there are certainly some who would like to come out of the, you know, out of the shadows and into the light, as it were. Um, but I think there are also, uh, and you certainly see this in California, there are people who, who understand that they're going to be at a disadvantage. And so the industry people who are against it, I mean industry people, I think are often people who prefer not to be playing by the rules. And from my point of view, and I would really encourage you and your folks to think about this too. It is a good thing to have industry actors who are ethical, who are committed to following the rules um, and playing by the rules. And yes, we live in a capitalist society and our campaign finance laws are what they are and so they will participate in that. But I don't, it, it, it is not a per se bad thing. And in fact, I think that those of us who are involved in this work and, and who come at it from an ethical point of view, are trying to engage with the emerging industry players to foster a ethos of being the good guys and a regulatory system that holds them accountable to do that. So I know, I know the campaigns are gonna wave the flag of you know, evil industry, it's just like tobacco, but it's, it's not fair and it's not true and it's not accurate. Do you think, do you think philant yeah, I'll let you get back to it, but, but do you think philanthropists would stay engaged? I could imagine someone saying, you know, I care about a lot of different things. Uh, I care about mass incarceration. I care about uh, uh, whatever, uh, child poverty or removing lead from the soil. And this industry is gonna provide this money. I'm, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna move on and go to my other causes and, uh, and let, let the industry you know, handle this from now. Why should I give my money? Because th this is this is going to be taken care of. Well, I mean, look. At at some point, I think that that the public perception of inevitability is going to become true, and I think that as you know, when when ten or twenty or thirty states have legalized marijuana, and it's just a question of sort of continuing that process and doing it the right way, there will be some philanthropists who want to see it done the right way. But it's not sort of the battle of trying to win an election as much as it is the task of trying to make sure implementation and, and the sort of further states do it in the right way. And that's already happening. There are philanthropists who are investing money not just in trying to win an election, but in trying to see that implementation and documentation, data collection is done the right way. And I think that's terrific. So I think, I, I think you're basically right, but I don't think that people are just gonna walk away from not, it. Not quickly. What, what was your experience with this, Allison? Initiative 502 um, was funded entirely by, almost entirely by people that supported the repeal of prohibition. Um, Peter Lewis was um, a major donor. Of the other donors that contributed anything of five figures above, um, one was uh, Bill Clapp, who um, runs an organization that provides microloans to uh, businesses in Latin America and was very distressed by the impact of U.S. drug policy on Latin America. 
Uh, Harriet Bullitt, one of my favorite early donors of a six-figure sum, um, was, uh, she was old enough to remember alcohol prohibition and had a family member who was murdered in connection with prohibition. Rick Steves, a travel writer of Europe Through the Back Doors, heavily influenced by the very pragmatic harm reduction drug policies that he's come uh, to understand uh, from his travels abroad. And uh, Floyd Jones, an investor, a uh, Seattle-based investor who grew up in Kansas, has long been invested in racial justice work and is very concerned about the disparate impact on black communities um, and especially young black men of marijuana law enforcement. He was a major contributor and subsequently uh, to Initiative 502's victory uh, made a very large uh, grant to the ACLU of Washington to support broader racial justice and criminal justice reform. Thank you. So Rob, could you tell us, how do you see the landscape? And uh, you know, your, your organization's negotiating, the, you, 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 were, you worked in an era where there were no legal businesses, now there are. Uh, it's a new source potentially of money for you, but you also probably have to balance a lot of interests when you do that. So you know, how, how are you approaching that as an organization and, and how do you hold the coalition together? <clears throat> so the, the revenues that flow through our coffers, um, well, let's talk about what money we do not get. So we do not get any government money and we don't get any traditional corporate money. So the money is in two buckets. It's philanthropy and it's can of businesses. Um, the, the amount of dollars we've raised from the cannabis industry is quite small. I'm always amused, and I agree with Graham's remarks, that the, the money is really traditional philanthropists, whether they're $5 a year or $500,000 a year, that's really where the revenues have been and where they will continue to be this year. To give you some perspective, in Colorado, which already had a mammoth medical marijuana industry in place in 2011 and 2012, when I was spending my time in Colorado trying to shake people down, um, when all said and done, all my blood, sweat, and tears, and staying at the Comfort Inn, downtown Denver, uh, we raised less than 5% of our budget from Colorado can of businesses. Less than 5%, which I guess means that I'm not a good fundraiser. So th it just wasn't there. Now, last year, our total budget was 10% can of businesses and 90% philanthropists. So that's sort of the broad overview. Now, looking at these particular elections this year, it'll depend on the state. So the number of dollars for the Arizona campaign will be a very large number of dollars from the industry there, just because I was able, with a team of people, to be able to negotiate a, a partnership in Arizona where it's some philanthropic money and some can of business money. So Arizona is uh, an area where uh, the folks in the medical marijuana industry are stepping up to the plate. But then in other states like Maine, the number of dollars from the industry will be close to zero. It'll be $10,000 or $15,000 or some small number. So it kind of depends on the state. And related to that, it depends on how mature the medical marijuana market is in that state as of today. And do you find any of your traditional donors, you know, I think of the I, you know, I, when I go up to Humboldt County, you know, the, the descendants of the hippies, pretty anti-materialistic pot enthusiasts who have always favored legalization, but don't, they're, they're, they're kind of uncomfortable with uh, capitalism, I guess you'd say. Do, they, do you find any of them saying, hey, you know, don't take money from them, you know, keep, keep, keep it real, Rob, you know, <laughs> do, do you get that at all? Uh, yes. <laughs> and... Uh, I say, all right, well, well while we're being real, uh, how much money have you donated and how much money are you willing to donate? And the answers are zero and zero. And then I say, therefore, I don't care what you have to say because you're, you've already taken yourself out of the conversation. Now, if these folks in Humboldt County and other counties were willing to donate money and sit at the table and be players, we would certainly embrace them and build the coalition. But most people who use marijuana and most people who grow and most people who sell in the illegal market, 99.9% .9 of them actually are not participating financially or otherwise. Which, by the way, is not necessarily special because 99% of the entire American people aren't participating, right? So it's only the people who care passionately either for, because of money or because of philanthropy and civil liberties and racial justice, only the people who care passionately donate. So the marijuana issue is actually no different from other issues. Thanks. So, so Jeff, you wanted to comment a bit about this issue and about the influence of, or, or uh, what you perceive as the influence of uh, the corporate donation changing this round of initiatives. What specifically would you point to to say these initiatives are different because of this new money? 
I mean, I think Arizona is actually a great example. I mean, if you look at the way the bill is written or the initiative is written, it creates it creates an oversight, but sort of a policy oversight board, and it, it it gives of the nine seats that are there, four of them must by law be occupied by people with an equity interest in a marijuana business. Now that is very unusual. I mean, even for again somebody who's seen a lot of unusual political activity, um, and I think it it you know. Just for the casual observer, it reflects a very strong industry hand uh, because the the corporate block on that board will always, always be one vote away from a majority on that board. And so it's hard to say, I mean, Graham, I appreciate your thoughts about nudging people towards ethicality, however that's defined. But I do think, I mean, especially speaking from someone with a lot of experience, you know, experience as a management consultant, et cetera, and uh, someone who worked in you know, sort of corporate <coughs> legal field for a while, I, I, I do, it, it strikes me as frankly, I mean, it's just unrealistic. Uh, businesses that are accountable to their equity holders in general, they have to be accountable to their equity holders. And in equity holders, and this isn't a bad, this is a morally neutral thing, equity holders generally want to you know, maximize the return on the equity that they've invested in their business. So it is perfectly natural for those businesses to want to stack the deck in terms of regulations. Uh, it is perfectly natural for them to do what they're trying to do in Nevada, which I find very interesting, where it will be not just illegal, but actually a, an arrestable, imprisonable offense in certain recidivist, sort of in certain cases, to grow your own marijuana within 25 miles of a retail marijuana store, which effectively means if you have one marijuana store in the city of Las Vegas, you have another one in the city of Reno, it basically wipes out the home grow in any urban area in Nevada uh, of any, uh, you know, significant uh, material size. And those are unusual things, and I think the devil is really in the details, and you need to look at sort of not what people say they do, they're doing, but what they're actually doing. And so, uh, you know, when you look at Arizona, you look at Nevada, and you look at Massachusetts, frankly, which has a similar situation. They have an advisory panel of 15 members that's supposed to be created at the government level, and nine of them will effectively be controlled by industry representatives, the way that the bill is written. Now, again, it makes perfect sense if you're putting money on the table, that you want that sort of return on investment and you want a bill that's going to, 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 to help you. Um, so again, it's just a very sort of morally neutral thing in the sense that it's perfectly understandable human behavior. But the idea that, again, it's well-intentioned, I understand that, but the idea that, you know, the PAC can, a PAC can nudge that, that corporate behavior towards some sort of ethical standard, I, I think is, it just misses the entire way that businesses actually function uh, in, in reality. So that, that's really just the point that I wanted to make. I'm not doubting your, your motives, I just think that it's, it's frankly, it's not, it's not the way that, that humans actually behave. So um, I just, I want to get to the medical issues in a minute, but I want to give a chance for rebuttal. Are any of you working on Nevada or uh, Arizona who can comment, want to respond? Is, is your group working on that, Rob? Do you, you want to just uh, give your view on what Jeff just said? Those specific things, please. Yeah. You want me to uh, specifically Nevada and Arizona? And yeah, the yeah. Of is that, are those, are those, is that, is, do you consider that accurate, the, uh, the rule against home growing within 25 miles of a residence, the control right. of uh, the industry by uh, uh, industry players, basically? Right. Well, we drafted both of those initiatives, so I could definitely speak in the first person about this. Uh, so in Nevada, I thought it was interesting, your comment just now, because you were, you were sort of trying to portray the lack of home grow as a bad thing, uh, because somehow it gives the industry a leg up, when in fact, one of the reasons that we included such restrictions against home grow is that we were trying to appeal to uh, folks on your side of the aisle uh, who are scared of people growing plants. So. That was actually a compromise we did in order to get in line with mainstream voters in Nevada. Now, in terms of these, the industry donating in Arizona and Nevada and presumably other states, um, this is not an instance where people are knocking on our doors and saying, you know, hey, we have a bunch of money and we want to bribe you to write the initiative the way that we want. It's actually the reverse. I actually want to raise money from these folks. So I'm knocking on their doors. They usually ignore me the first time. So then we knock harder and eventually we get their attention and we say, we really want you to participate, not only because we want you to fund part of this campaign, but also from a public policy perspective, if you're gonna legalize marijuana, who do you want to be the folks who are gonna be growing and selling marijuana for recreational purposes? You wanna count on the folks who already are involved in the industry who already are doing that for medical marijuana. So there's a couple of advantages. One is you already know who the good players are because if these people who are involved with medical marijuana businesses are bad players, they would have already gotten their licenses yanked. So you have good players 
financially interested to make sure that the system works, and by allowing medical marijuana businesses to convert into recreational if they so choose, so we don't force them to, they could choose to and they will choose to, uh, you're able to then get legalization off the ground sooner because you don't have to build new buildings and, and plant new crops and so forth. You could actually convert to legalization quickly, which is our incentive. We want to convert to legalization as quickly as possible in order to keep people out of jail ASAP. Thank you for that, Rob. We, we only have about uh, eight minutes left for discussion before we open it to questions. We haven't talked about medical initiatives at all. So let me, let me pose a provocative uh, question. Does medical marijuana matter anymore? Or was that really just a, a step in America's move towards legalization? I mean, you saw, you know, during Prohibition, you were allowed to have alcohol for medicinal purposes. And uh, you can go online and see Winston Churchill's prescription when he came to the United States that his doctor said it was very important that he have hard liquor at every meal. Um, and it, the, the, the way Americans feel more comfortable with drugs when they for, for medicinal th uh, purposes. And the, and the medical system in California and I think in Washington were quite loose. I mean, it sort of functioned quasi-recreationally. So when, now we get to the point where most Americans are comfortable with recreational. Is, is, the medical, is the medical important anymore or will states just go, you know, straight for the, the whole enchilada, so to speak? You go into that? Any, anyone, anyone who wants to comment? comment? Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, yeah, medical marijuana remains important. Um, it, it, is, it is legitimately, I, I mean, what you said, that it, it is sort of, you know, in, in, in California, certainly, there are plenty of people who are not, in, in any sense, seriously ill, um, who are using the medical marijuana system as a way to avoid, or, you know, getting into legal trouble, and who could blame them for doing that? Um, and, and that's the way that that law was written back in 1996. But where we will be in fairly short order is medical marijuana will be legal throughout the United States. It's going to pass this year in Florida, probably in Missouri and Arkansas. I mean, if those states have a majority of voters enacting a medical marijuana initiative, then it's just a matter of time before it's everywhere else. And there's 80% plus support among voters nationwide. Um, but, when, but as legalization then proceeds, I think what you're going to find is that the medical system will, will sort of shrink to serve the people who really do have uh, you know, unusual uh, and specific needs for marijuana as medicine. And at the same time, as the ban on research or restrictions on research is, are, are lifted, we're going to know a lot more about the specifics of marijuana as medicine. So medical marijuana is not going to go away, um, but I think it will take a place that is sort of specific and in some ways um, circumscribed um, as legalization proceeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone disagree with that? Do you, or do you see that? Uh, so do you, um, go ahead. No, I agree with Graham. I'll, I'll, I'll reflect on that. You know, medical marijuana is alive for you know a couple of reasons, and I don't know if it was noted earlier, but you know, the governor of Pennsylvania is signing the medical marijuana bill today. So Pennsylvania, as of today, is the 24th state to legalize medical marijuana. So that's wonderful news. So the so why is medical marijuana still relevant? Well, if you look at the states that are currently debating serious medical marijuana bills. Um, Louisiana is currently in play. Nebraska came close but failed. Utah came close but failed. Uh, these are states where legalization isn't even a twinkle in someone's eye. And so if it's a choice between doing nothing or at least getting the sick and dying off the battlefield, then we're going to work on getting the sick and dying off the battlefield. And luckily for us, medical marijuana is actually has a higher level of public support than most politicians who have to vote on it. So when we're in the legislatures in these states, we can actually hold up the polls and say, one way to make yourself more popular going into this coming election is to vote for medical marijuana, because medical marijuana is as popular as public parks in some places. So uh, yes, it is still alive. However, we are, are, what we really want is to pass legalization in Nebraska, but we're not even close to that. And so it's not even worth having that discussion, and we want to at least accomplish something, something useful to keep some people out of jail. Thanks, Rob. Jeff, I'll give you the last word on medical and questions. Sure. Just a couple quick comments. I mean, you know, obviously our organization does see it as effectively a stalking horse for, for recreational use, but just that to one side, really. I mean, it, it's sort of two things. I think in the, the longer term, you will see a real 
tension between a medical system and a fully recreational system, especially at the, if, if, if it is legalized at the federal level. Just because it, it, once you have it available at a corner store, et cetera, that without a prescription, it, for, for somebody who wants easy access to, to, to the, you know, unless it's sort of some sort of very skewed taxation regime where you can get the medical product more cheaply, people will just purchase it and self-medicate. Um, but secondly, I think the big question mark, for, for me at least personally, is what happens if there is a federal rescheduling that, that, that changes marijuana's designation uh, under the Controlled Substances Act. And I think that, you know, right now the FDA has stayed out of this because as a Schedule One drug, they, they see it as, well, it's DEA's job and we're not really going to exercise any type of real meaningful enforcement over it. If it is rescheduled, uh, and this I'm not saying, I mean, we, 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 we oppose rescheduling because we, we think it's, you know, again, that the components of marijuana may have medicinal value, but we don't see the whole plant as, as medicine. But that having been said, were it to be rescheduled, it's really unclear what the FDA's oversight role would be and where it would end up in terms of uh, an, an actual business and what it would mean, I think, not only for the medical market, but frankly, for the, the, the recreational market as well. Because if the FDA is saying, look, marijuana is a Schedule II drug, but you have to go through this approval process, et cetera, otherwise we're coming after you, where does it leave the, 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 the non-medical uses? So I, I don't pretend to have the answer to that question, but I think it's a big, it's a big open sort of uh, issue right now. Thank you. Let's thank our panel. Really terrific.